Welcome back to our book reading from Religion to Christ by Peter Jeffrey. We are on to chapter 8, which is titled Death or Life. And Peter Jeffrey writes, In John 3.16, we have seen the action of God and the response of man. This order is important. If God had not loved us and given us Jesus to die for us, there could be nothing for us to respond to. We look now at the problem the gospel seeks to erase in its ultimate achievement. This is all summed up in the words perish and everlasting life. The great purpose of the gospel is to prevent men and women from perishing. What does perish mean and why do we perish? The answer to why is clear from the passage. It is the result of sin. This is seen in the illustration of Moses and the snake. Why did the Israelites die in the desert? Because they were bitten by snakes? No, it was because they had sinned. The snakes were simply God's means of bringing death. The truth is further expounded by Jesus in John 3.19. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. Death or perishing is God's judgment upon human sin. God made this very clear before a single sin had been committed. He said in Genesis 2.17, You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good or evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So perishing means death, which is the certain result of sin. It is the judgment of God's holy wrath upon sin. Paul spells it out for us in Romans 5.12, where he says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. This is the awful truth, but we cannot leave it there. Perish or death in John 3.16 is the opposite to eternal life. Not the opposite of life, but to eternal life. This is very important because all the sects and the many nominal Christians say death means the end of conscious existence or annihilation, and therefore there is no hell. They all reject the concept of eternal conscious punishment in hell. But the context shows that perish means far more than losing physical existence. Sin is a spiritual problem, and its condemnation is a spiritual as well as a judicial act of God. Therefore, its punishment is also spiritual and not merely physical. The perishing in John 3.16 indicates divine condemnation, complete and everlasting, so that the guilty sinner is banned from the presence and love of God and dwells forever in the presence of the wrath of God. Annihilation is obviously to be separated from the love of God, but it ignores the New Testament teaching of the eternal wrath of God. Matthew 25, 41, 46, and Luke 16, 22 through 26. The Bible uses picture language to describe hell, but what is clear is that the fires of hell are the wrath of the holy God. It is the awfulness of sin that makes hell necessary, but it is the holiness of God that creates hell. Hell is to be exposed without a Savior to the holiness of God for all eternity. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-9 and Hebrews 10, 27-31 In the New Testament, it is Jesus who speaks mostly about hell, and he has some terrible things to say about it. But by far the most terrible word the Savior used about hell is eternal. Hell is as eternal as heaven. There is no end to it. In life, even in the darkest moments, there is always the hope that things will get better. There is no such hope in hell. Souls are lost forever. Listen to Charles Spurgeon, quote, On every chain in hell is written, forever. If I could tell you that one day the fires of hell will burn out, that the lost might be saved, then there would be rejoicing in hell at the very thought. But it cannot be so, forever damned, forever cast into outer darkness. Unquote. That is what it means to perish, and Jesus came to save us from that. The adjective everlasting or eternal is used 17 times in John's Gospel, and always with a noun, life. It speaks of a quality of life, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Chapter 17, verse 3. But it also speaks of duration of life, 
It is never ending. Eternal life starts not at death, but at new birth. It starts when we know God. It is a quality of life experienced now that is altogether different from life under the dominion of sin, and it is a foretaste, in a limited way, of heaven. Heaven is the eternal dwelling place of all those who have been born again. It is a place where there is no sin, no pain, no suffering, because there the rule of God's righteousness is complete and unchallenged. There we shall be free from the corruption of human nature. There we shall see Jesus face to face and be like him, not equal to him, but like him in that sin will not dominate us. Everlasting life is everlasting happiness without the slightest shadow or blemish to it. And for a being like man, who was made in the image of God, made by God, and for God, such happiness must consist in knowing God without any hindrance from sin. John Brown said it will mean, quote, having our mind conformed to his mind, our wishes subjected to his pleasure, thinking along with him, willing along with him, choosing what he chooses, seeking and finding enjoyment in what he finds enjoyment. This is life. This is happiness. And the never-ending continuance of this is everlasting life." Unquote. To know God transforms a person and introduces him to a life he could not otherwise experience. To know God is to have eternal life, and this is what the gospel seeks to give us. God loved us for this purpose. God gave his Son to die on a cross so that we may know this. The gospel is great because its author is great, its subject is great, its gift is great, and its achievement is great, that sinners should not perish, but have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. The situation the gospel addresses itself to is not a pleasant one. Souls perishing and going to hell is not pleasant, but it is the truth, and the gospel is concerned with the truth. Many people object strenuously to the preaching of hell. Hellfire preaching today is a term of scorn and amusement. But the fact is that the New Testament speaks of this terrible place, and for us to pretend that it does not exist or remain silent on the subject is to do the greatest possible disservice to sinful mankind. Several years ago, a city in the United States was concerned about the noise level on its streets, and they decided to ban the use of car horns. The harsh, noisy sound was silenced, but after a while they discovered there was a sharp rise of deaths in the city roads, and they had to bring back the car horns. The horn is a harsh, noisy intrusion, but it is a necessary warning, and it saves lives. The preaching of hell, likewise, is a serious warning to sinners, and the gospel has no hesitation about declaring it, because the gospel has the answer to this terrible truth. To preach hell, and not at the same time to preach God's answer to it, is to preach something that is not the gospel. The gospel says men's need not perish, because Jesus has conquered sin, death, and hell. Listen to Paul's great shout of praise in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. Where, O death, is your sting? Where, O Hades, is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel answer to sin and hell is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life.